Authentically Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Monday of the month, which means it's time for Monday with the McDougals, and we have none other than Dr. John McDougal, and he's going to be talking about low-carb diets. Are they healthy? Are they not healthy? Are they a fraud? But before I introduce him, I got a special gift from Linda Middlesworth in honor of Dr. McDougal, and I'm wearing that shirt today. And Dr. McDougal is also wearing a very nice shirt. Please welcome him back to the show. It's always great to see you, Dr. McDougal. Oh, thank you. I just, I, you know, I, I must be preaching to the choir to talk to you about low-carb diets, but let's, you know, what I'd like to do is kind of put it all together for you in a short presentation where you can confront those who no differently, okay? They think a low-carb diet is the way to go. Well, only if they're dealing with alternative facts, not if they're dealing with science. The science clearly says that low-carb diets are a form of uh, food poisoning, which causes you to be so sick in a state of ketosis that you don't eat, you lose weight. But but I'd be, um, I'd be lacking in my presentation if I didn't, if I didn't talk also about the the new form of food poisoning, of, of poisoning of the body to cause you to lose weight. And that, of course, is the GLP-1 agonists like Ozempic and Wegovy and et cetera. They've got new ones coming out every week. And we're going to talk about those too. And, and you are hopefully will come to the conclusion that there's nothing wrong with you. Okay. Your appetite is not correct. Your stomach was not designed too big for your body. Uh, you may have some emotional and mental issues going on in your life, but overeating is not one of them. And uh, I think you have to start from that point of view that the human creation is correct. And uh, so is the appetite. You know, I've talked to you about the the drives that keep us alive. There are lots of drives we have, but some that don't keep us alive that we kill for, like sex huh. and money. In occupations, you know, you don't have to, you know, to, to succeed in business uh, is not a criterion criterion for staying alive. Okay, but people, people kill for that. That's how important it is to them. There are only three things that uh, are required to keep you alive, and they uh, are satisfied by drives known as breath, thirst, and hunger. And you can't deny any of these drives, not for long, otherwise you die. And they're there to keep you alive. So how long can you deny the, 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 the desire to breathe? Well, maybe three minutes, maybe if you're trained, maybe longer. How about water? Maybe maybe three days, maybe, maybe longer. Uh, how about no food? Well, the average person dies in 60 days. They have 60 days of fat storage. And then they run out of fat and they die from fat deficiency, not from protein deficiency or any other deficiencies. <clears throat> they die from a lack of fat on their body and their nerves and so on. So anyway, uh, that's why the hunger drive is designed so powerfully. And we found ways to deal with it. But you have to understand it's, uh, you know, uh, really, really what you're dealing with before you decide you're going to fight it and see if you can win. I don't know. Seems have like you ever, most people. You, Dr. McDougall, have you ever tried a low carb diet just to see? No, no, I, I, except for I did it by accident. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, I used to have like, well, I don't know, three eggs for breakfast and went on to bologna sandwiches for lunch. And yeah, I had some white bread with it. So that was carbohydrate. And for dinner, you know, it was often steak and green vegetables. So I suppose I was on a low carb diet, but it's only only because that's the way my parents believe that I should eat to get necessary nutrients. In other words, get necessary calcium and necessary protein. They didn't realize the science clearly said that on, on, on any natural diet, a human being will get enough protein and calcium. It's impossible to miss unless you're on in some experimental laboratory where they synthesize a, a diet for you that you know is unnaturally missing these nutrients. I mean, it doesn't happen ever in nature. But of course, my parents believe that, and the low carb diets are a continuation of that kind of brainwashing. That you know, as long as you get enough protein, you know that's important. As long as you get calcium, that's important. Whereas uh, you know, plants have been relegated to the background, but incorrectly. 
Anyway, there's a tremendous amount of sickness out there. And uh, there are people who who deal with the hunger drive by just eating with enthusiasm. And we've never seen a, such a pandemic, and it's becoming a pandemic worldwide, <clears throat> of obesity. We're in countries that are developed like the United States, where there are all kinds of rich foods, lots of fat, lots of calories, lots of convenience. We have a population where well, I've, I've seen estimates as many as 40% of people are obese. That means they have more than 30% of their body is made of fat. And when you get to morbid obesity, you know, 40% of your body is made of fat. But being just overweight, maybe more than 20% of your body is fat. So somewhere around 75, 80% of the population in developed countries are overweight or obese. In other words, they're sick. You know, they have uh, pre-diabetes at a rate of half the population. Frank diabetes, somewhere between 12 and 14% are frankly diabetic from the obesity. And, you know, we have we have a, a lot of sickness out there. And that's when people answer their hunger drive with the foods available. The, they realize they're in trouble. You know, uh, being overweight is the most obvious thing. They look in the mirror, they try and fit in an airplane seat. I mean, they they kind of figure it out. Go to, they have to go to the plus size sections of the stores if they have any anymore. I don't even know that if they have plus size Maybe plus size is normal these days, and and uh, what you shop is uh, is the the rarer section of the medium size or small size or regular size. Anyway, you, you finally come to the realization that you've got a problem, and uh, you feel the pain of hunger, and so you say, "Well, I just won't eat." And that pain is so severe it has to be. A hungry person can only see food. Now, I've given you an experiment before to ask you to go. Well, let's get into the slide presentation we'll talk about. It. And then the uh, the other two things is if you're not going to be in the pain of hunger, the other options are to uh, somehow mute the hunger drive, somehow uh, make the, uh, the 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 thoughts of of eating go away or be less driving for you. And that is the development of the low carb diets and reptile poisoning with the uh, GLP-1 agonists like Ozempic. That's what we're going to talk about today. Put it in perspective, give it just in a form where hopefully you'll be able to sit somebody down and in 20, 30 minutes, I don't know how long I'm going to take on this presentation, you'll be able to say, look, what's your argument? What, 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 where do you come from? Uh, the first thing we need to deal with is the hunger drive. Uh, this has been studied thoroughly by Ansel Keys. During uh, <clears throat> World War II, they did the Minnesota starvation experiment. And uh, in Minneapolis, what they did is they took over uh, one of the fairgrounds and they got 36 conscientious objectors to go uh, to, to go hungry during an 11 month experiment. What the, this was in, during World War II when people were starving in Western Europe and people were very conscious of, of hunger because millions were starving. And so they did this experiment for 11 months and what they did is they started with a baseline where they fed these 36 conscientious objectors. They fed them about uh, 3,500 calories a day, which they figured is what these men needed. And then they cut their calorie intake in half to around 1,550 calories a day, in half. Now it's important that you realize they only cut it to 1,500 calories. They weren't in ketosis, okay? You've got to go down to around 200 calories of carbohydrate before you get into ketosis. And they're taking in 1,500 calories daily, probably, so they bought 1,000 milligrams of carbohydrate. So they're not in ketosis. So they're suffering with pain because they cut their food in, in half. Well, they ask them to go without satisfying their hunger drive for six months. And so they did. And the foods that they ate or desired were the foods that were similar to what they're eating in Western Europe to stay alive. You know, we, we discovered a, a new source of starch, and that was tulip bulbs that the, the people, the Dutch people, ate to stay alive. You know, people at these times ate foods similar to what you folks and I eat during times of desperation because of those are the foods that were available that would keep them alive, starches, fruits and vegetables. Anyway, um, I did this experiment, the... Uh, the Minnesota starvation experiment, Ansel Keys was in charge, find out what hunger was all about. <clears throat> and uh, so they started at 3,200 calories, they cut it in half, they suffered from the pain of hunger. Remember, you have to go down to around 200 calories of carbohydrate 
50 grams before you go into ketosis, which we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Anyway, six months of semi-starvation where it really hurt. And um, food became the central part of their lives. Uh, they talked about food. They daydreamed about food. <laughs> they had dreams at night about food. They, they all they thought about was food. They read cookbooks. They read books about food. They they sat down at the dinner table and they would shove people next to them aside so they didn't envy their food or take their food. They'd eat the last crumb. They would lick the crumbs off the plate. <sighs> And of course, they lost weight. They lost interest. They became very fatigued. They lost their interest in sex. These All these men had no interest in women. Anxious, depressed, all kinds of uh, physical disturbances from semi-starvation. Headaches, decreased appetite, tiredness to conserve calories. And of course, they lost a tremendous amount of weight, sometimes as much as 50 pounds or a third of their body weight. Anyway, uh, <laughs> for six months, they were hungry. They would rubbish through the garbage cans. You know, just to get some idea, these, these people, a hungry person can only think about food. Now, if you have any doubt, what I challenge you is an experiment that Mary and I did maybe 30 years ago. It was uh, an experiment to help us understand starvation that was occurring in Africa, particularly among children. And as a part of the group that I was involved in at that time, the congregation, we, we talked about every every Sunday about how people suffered. And I, as the personality that I am, I suggested, why don't we show some empathy for these people? Why don't we find out what it's like to be hungry? So I got half the congregation to go along with not eating for a whole weekend. And I can tell you what it was like, and I encourage you to experience it. If you think you can deny your hunger drive, just go 72 hours without food. And Friday night, no big deal. Saturday morning, I didn't think much about, about food. Saturday afternoon, I started thinking about food. And by Saturday night, I had no more money problems, no more friend problems. I had no more of any kind of problems. All I could think about was food. And Sunday, we all got together in mid-afternoon and Mary fixed a meal of lentil stew, flatbread, rice, and green salad. And for those of us who'd gone for those two days plus without any food, that was one of the best meals we ever had. Now, what happens after about three days is you change your metabolism from carbohydrate, glycolysis, sugar, to fat metabolism. And that's where you get into the ketose diets. That's what we're going to talk about. But we first have to decide that, you, you know, the hunger drive can't be beat by willpower. And there's nothing wrong with you. All right, so what has satisfies the hunger drive? Well, there are all kinds of experiments that have been done that you can look at. And I encourage you to do this. Uh, what they find uh, when they ask people how satisfied they feel after different meals, they find that after low fat meals, they take in fewer calories to become fully satisfied. For example, a low-fat diet, they took in 2,158 calories before they felt they were satisfied. On a high-fat meal, they had to take in almost 800 more calories before they had satisfaction to diety, before they were done eating. It's carbohydrate that satisfies the hunger diet. This is one way to determine that. Another way to determine it is you feed different kinds of breakfasts to people. These are experiments you're going to look up. And what you find is on a high fat diet, people report that there's, they're still hungry hours later. But on a high carbohydrate diet, they feel satisfied. And so they report after eating different kinds of breakfasts. Uh, another set of experiments, they started out again with breakfasts and they had, had people eat either what they consider a normal breakfast, a high fat breakfast or a high carbohydrate breakfast. And then they put on a plate of sandwiches after breakfast. And they told people to eat until they were satisfied. And what they found is on the high fat breakfast, people were still ravenously hungry and ate more sandwiches afterwards. They weren't satisfied. And then the fourth type of experiment you will want to look at. And there, were, there, there are no experiments that show that low carbohydrate diets are satisfying folks. In fact, they show the opposite, that 
fat does not satisfy the appetite. And here's the experiment that shows that. Uh, this is done on people in a metabolic ward. In other words, they, they have total control of them. They fix various kinds of meals that you can hide fat in the meals. For example, they hid fat in muffins and breads and sandwiches, desserts, soups and stews. And so they took butter and mayonnaise and vegetable oil and cream and margarine and stuck it in the bread, in the cereals and the stews. But people didn't know that they did that back in the kitchen. And they told them to eat as much as they wanted. On and and what they found is when they when they stuck fat in the food, people would eat on average 2,700 calories a day when the diet was around 40, 45 to 50% fat. But just by taking the fat out of the food, which as a compensation, you increase the amount of carbohydrate, they spontaneously took in 600 fewer calories because carbohydrate satisfies the hunger drive, just like oxygen satisfies breath. No other gas will do it. And water satisfies thirst. No other liquid such as alcohol will do it. So these are the, these are the research papers that show that car carbohydrate satisfies your hunger drive. <clears throat> you also may remember your high school biology, the tip of the tongue, tastes with pleasure carbohydrate. Not just simple sugar, but you also have starch, starch-seeking taste buds. Look up the chemical sense paper that I cite here, and you'll see at Oregon State University that it experiments were showed you have taste buds specific for starch, bread, rice, bread, corn, that cause you to seek starch that are just as powerful as the ones that cause you to seek sugar. The taste bud for fat, if you can taste fat, you are repulsed by fatty foods. So it works the opposite. You don't seek, you are repulsed by fat. And then there's taste buds for bitter and sour to protect you from poisoning. So all it's from the beginnings of your education, you learn that glycolysis, glucose metabolism is the primary energy source of the body. You remember the tip of the tongue tastes with pleasure. You remember all day long, you love sweet things. Anyway. Okay, so how do you fool this hunger drive? Well, what you do is you you cause it to, to go into a, a kind of metabolism that's different than glycolysis. When you run out of sugar, you've got to keep the body alive, so you start burning fat. And when you burn fat, what you do is you create byproducts called ketones. They, they smell like acetone, if you, if you can relate to that. You can smell it on people's breath. They're in ketosis. And ketones suppress the hunger drive. So you have to realize there's no carbohydrate in meat. Cheese has 2% of the carbohydrates. It's carbohydrates, calories. Eggs, no carbohydrate. All right? So your carnivore diet, your Atkins kind of diet, your low-carb diets, your keto diets are carbohydrate deficient. So if you're going to stay alive, the body has to burn fat. Okay, this is a high carbohydrate diet that we eat, low fat. That's where most of your calories come from. And uh, this is going to be a low carbohydrate diet. Lots of fat, lots of protein, not too much because you can get sick from too much protein. Anyway, <clears throat> they've been very popular. They started maybe maybe 100 years ago. We had the beer drinkers diet. Then Atkins made them popular again in 1972. And uh, we have knockoffs of these ketone producing diets, such as wheat belly and grain brain. There are a couple of, of newer ones, all the same thing. They, they talk about the bliss of going into a state of ketosis, but really ketosis occurs during times of sickness. It's really a state of sickness that occurs. Uh, I wrote a paper that really, I think made a difference in 2004. It was about the Atkins scientific research called deceit and disappointment. It actually got, got Michael Greger uh, interested in Atkins, and he did a whole website on the dishonesty and de deceit of the low carb diets. Right after this article that I wrote, that appeared in my read it; it's worthwhile. In here, I talk about uh, constipation that his studies proved patients had, like seventy percent of them were constipated, sixty or seventy percent had bad breath. I, I showed that the weight losses were, were hardly significant. That's his original research that started this whole movement. 
anyway, the way these uh, low carb diets work is when you don't have sugar for energy, in other words, sugar, carbohydrate, starch, you don't have that for energy and all you have is fat, whether it be vegetable fat or animal fat, that's what the cells turn to. Not all the cells, but most of the cells. They could, they could, burn, uh, they could burn fatty acids, but in the process of burning fat, fatty acids, you produce ketones and ketones suppress the hunger drive. Now I say that not all body parts can run on fat. They can't, like red blood cells can't run on fat. Certain kidney cells can't run on fat. They have to, they require sugar, absolutely. So if you don't eat enough sugar to supply these cells, the body will take protein from your muscles or the food you eat. And through gluconeogenesis, it will convert protein into sugar. So you can stay alive. And that's how desperate the body is to stay alive under starvation conditions. And you go into ketosis. Why? Because starvation is painful. After three, four, five days of starvation, the pain of hunger is depressed, muted, tolerable until you die 60 days later. So you can figure out how to get yourself out of trouble rather than thinking about food all the time. It's a survival mechanism. The same thing occurs, ketosis occurs when you get really, really, really sick. Why? Because you're supposed to be rec recuperating. Not, not gathering and preparing food, you're sick. So the body naturally goes into ketosis. So that's one of the reasons I call these low carb diets, the make yourself sick diets. They work with a mechanism that occurs when you are sick or when you starve for a prolonged period of time. Short term. Um, doctors who write about these low carb diets and they still do today, same doctors that Atkins enrolled back in 2004. The same people. Anyway, uh, one of them uh, wrote an article in Nail Clinic Proceedings about how low carb diets are so great because not only do you lose weight, and you do, you lose, and that's why people follow them, you lose a lot of weight the first week because you don't have any sugar stored in your liver and muscles in the form of glycogen. So the body burns the stored sugar first because that's what it's supposed to burn. And once you lose the stored sugar, the glycogen, you lose about six to eight pounds of weight on the scale because your body stores two pounds of glycogen, which when they're metabolized and utilized, take along with them four molecules of water. So you lose six pounds, two of sugar and four of water the first week because you don't have any sugar in your diet. And then what happens is you go into it a, a state of sickness and you don't eat because of all this protein, you have a diuresis. So yeah, you do lose weight. And because you lose weight, your blood sugar comes down, your blood pressure comes down, your cholesterol comes down. And in this article that was a Mayo Clinic proceedings, the doctors are bragging, not only do these keto diets cause you to lose weight, but they cause you to have great health. Look at the blood pressure, look at the cholesterol, look at the blood sugar. Proof. Well, my contention, as I wrote in this article, which they published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings, is that you get similar benefits by any way that you make people sick. And they they don't eat and they lose weight, even cancer chemotherapy. And what doctors would brag about a weight loss clinic that they run that utilizes cancer chemotherapy. You shouldn't be proud of this, of causing people to lose weight by making them sick fellow colleagues, doctors. No, you shouldn't. All right. There are uh, there are uh, four papers that I want you to look up and read. All right, I, I presented it for you here. The references are there. You can read them, have your friends read them. They are all studies of the effects of low carb diets on your chances of living and dying of heart disease. And all four reviews show low carb diets increase your chances of dying, all cause and cause specific mortality. In other words, dying from heart disease. Every single review shows that. Of all the studies published, there are no such reviews on high carbohydrate diets. They're only on the keto diets. There's the research, look it up. Okay.
but scientists haven't stopped studying the, the harmful effects of these low carb diets. This is just published, uh, Journal of Internal Medicine, just this year, showing that if you eat a high carbohydrate diet, you have a, a chance of living 18% longer. What's 18%? Like, you know, maybe 10, 12, 14 years longer. A, a lower risk of dying of heart disease, similar percentage, lower risk of cancer. You know, we're talking about meaningful years that you lose by eating these high carbohydrate diets. And this is a study of like almost 400,000 people that are middle-aged and older, just published. That's why I, not only are these the make yourself sick diets immediately and cause you to lose weight, long-term they make you sick too and they will kill you. Now, if you eat, uh, you eat the Atkins type diet, they, they push more fat. The keto diets push more protein. Uh, it, it's uh, anyway. The, the, these kinds of diets really focus on on protein, such as the paleo diet. Lauren Cordain, you know, he really pushed protein with the idea that we're hunter gatherers and that we were hunters primarily. And of course, hunters went out and killed things. Of course, hunters were males too, men. They went out and killed things like rabbits and caught salmon and so on. And they brought them back to the village and that's what people ate. But one of the problems is if uh, all that's available during say a winter time are things like salmon or rabbits, which are, you know, I guess pretty pretty easily caught. If that's what your diet is, you die from, from what we call protein poisoning. And I have to tell you the paleo diets and the keto diets approach the level where protein poisoning occurs, where about 30 to 40% of the calories are protein. People get sick, people die. You know, it's not only fat that makes you fat, and fat that encourages cancer and heart disease, it's the protein. Okay, well, what we're talking about, of course, in keto is is animal foods and secretions of animals. Uh, heart disease, okay, by two mechanisms, cholesterol, and also by, by changes in bowel bacteria that cause the body to produce something called trimethylamine, oxidized, oxidate, TMAO. Okay, TMAO is toxic to the blood vessels. And uh, TMA comes from carnitine, and choline, which are animal products or supplements. So you eat carnitine and choline, which is an animal products or animal protein supplements. And it goes into the bowel to produce trimethylamine. And this trimethylamine is uh, allowed to be produced by the bacteria that grow in meat eaters. Vegans don't have bacteria in their bowel to convert carnitine and choline into trimethylamine. All right. So if you happen to not be a vegan and have the right bacteria in your bowel, what happens is you make trimethylamine in the bowel, which goes into the into the body and in the liver it's converted to trimethylamine oxide. And by the way, trimethylamine is, is something that smells like like fish. We call it fish odor. Trimethylamine oxide is odorless but it's toxic to the blood vessels. So there are many mechanisms by which eating these keto recommended foods will damage your arterial system. And of course you get all kinds of problems all the way from blindness to impotency. All right, you also have when you eat these high animal foods is you have the problem with uh, contamination. All right, uh, these animal products are full of fat the chemicals that cause cancer, brain damage, et cetera, are fat soluble. They get sucked up and, and uh, attracted and sucked up and accumulated by fat. And so as you eat going up the food chain, you, you suffer from something called bioaccumulation, where your body accumulates these chemicals and, and it magnifies the amount of chemicals. So we call it biomagnification. So as you go from the grasses and grains that have a little bit of poison, environmental chemicals that are fat soluble. You go to say fish or cows or sheep or something that's that's eating the grasses and grains, 
they'll take these chemicals that are fat soluble and they'll increase them through biomagnification hundreds or thousands fold. And then the next one on the food chain would be the person that eats the fish or, or the grazing animal. And they concentrate in their body you know, many fold again because they're fat soluble. All right, you end up eating more chemical as you move up the food chain. Anyways, the end of the food chain is the baby sucking off mother's breast. And it's so serious that breast milk is considered an, an, an environmental hazard because of the accumulation of pesticides in a woman's milk. Now you're dealing again with animal foods, uh, all kinds of organisms. You know, in, in the paper today, they're talking about climate change, as always, and uh, nobody's doing enough about it. But they're talking about how the problem front page today in your newspapers uh, is going to be contagious disease. Because, because of the warming of the planet. And, and where you get these contagious diseases are because you're an animal. You get them from other animals. So like bird flu and porcine viruses and mad cow disease. These things come from animals. You don't catch plant diseases. You don't catch Dutch elm disease or aphids or tobacco mosaic virus. You catch salmonella. You catch, you catch uh, listeria, mad cow prions, bovine leukemia viruses from animals. And, and because of the warmth that's occurring planet-wise, these viruses and other microbes, they thrive. So low-carb diets, there you go again. You're passing a bunch of diseases around to people. And then, of course, we have the autoimmune diseases, which are triggered by animal proteins. And then you have the problem of the load of the protein uh, causing the body to become acidic. Remember, proteins are made of amino acids. When you dump an acid load in the body, you have to neutralize the acid so the bones dissolve, which gives you osteoporosis and kidney stones. When uh, the low carbers, they go out and they brag about our low carb, it'll, it'll help Alzheimer's or cure Alzheimer's. It, it's uh, the right diet for cancer patients because because uh, carbs feed cancer, don't eat sugar, it feeds cancer. Well, when this was evaluated uh, in this particular and very important study just published in 2022, they said that this is nonsense. Low-carb diets are actually cancer promoters. And high-carb diets, plant food-based diets, are the ones you want to eat to prevent and treat cancer. I mean, the American Cancer Society came out in February of 2015 and said that people who have cancer need to be on a high carb diet and stay away from these low carb foods, the meats, et cetera. Uh, I think one of the most serious insults is one that caused, was caused by the big fat lies author, Gary Taubes. He went to a guy that came to our advanced study weekend, Kevin Hall from the National Institutes of Health. He came out and lectured for one weekend. So I got to know Kevin Hall a little bit. But anyway, uh, uh, Gary Taubes, he uh, challenged the scientific community to prove that there's an, an advantage to eating a low-carb diet as far as fat loss goes. In other words, you lose more fat by restricting carbohydrates than by restricting fat. In other words, you're going to lose more weight easier and faster by following a low-carb diet as opposed to a high-carb diet, which we recommend. Well... Kevin Hall put it to the test and he showed that you lose more fat, body fat, by restricting fat. Uh, the, uh, the foundation that Gary Taubes set up to pay for Kevin Hall's study, I believe went into bankruptcy. And they're not doing any more research, but, but Gary Taubes is still out there teaching a low carb diet along with a bunch of other uh, people who are, I would best characterize as conspiracy theorists. They take the data and they distort it and lie to the public. For what reason? Well, I, I want to tell you, uh, low-carb diets favor many industries. And money is the, 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 the cash is king. It's the card that is played. So what happens as far as people making money when you feed a diet that causes uh, people to be sick. Well, what would happen? 
you know, you, you, you make, you, you sell more of the expensive foods, the animal products. That's where the, and compare the cost of, of steak to potatoes. Okay, so you, you favor the, the meat, the egg, <clears throat> the fish, you know, the dairy industries. You favor them financially. And how about the spinoff uh, to the medical businesses, the hospitals, the pharmacies, et cetera? This is high profit message. It's it's a lie. It, it, at best, making alternative facts, which I know you're all familiar with. This is, they, they distort the science. They're conspiracy theorists. Uh, the other thing that people who recommend these high carb diets have to deal with is that this recommendation, which we've known about planetary warming, we've known that the animal agriculture contributes about half of the greenhouse gases that this planet is suffering from. And we know that if you switch to a vegan diet, you can reduce your CO2 production, carbon dioxide production by as much as 80% overnight. So low carb diets, high meat diets, so you're hurrying up the, the, the end of our, our only home. Good grief. And whew, need I say more? Would you eat this? How can somebody talk you to eating something that looks like this? Gross. You got to cover it up, don't you? You got to cover it up with, with, uh, you know, with the little green things you put over the top of it. What do they call that, JJ? Parsley you, and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Parsley, gosh, tomato yeah. slices. You got cut and make it look like it's something that's not. And then you got to put salt and sugar on it and spices to make it taste like something that's not. You won't eat this. And yet Gary Taubes and the other low carb keto carnivore people are trying to convince you that this is your food. All right, let's get on to the modern way of depressing the appetite. <laughs> Since low carb diets are, are so dangerous, cholesterols go up, you know, uh, constipated, kidney damage, you know, it, all the science is out. We're trying to find other ways to depress the appetite and drug companies are really good at that. Well, they discovered that, that the venom, the poisonous venom of a reptile, you know, like a diamondback rattlesnake, that's how toxic the venom is. But in this case, they they derive this venom from the lower jaw of the Gila monster, which is a reptile found in the Southwest United States. And what they found is that you get bit by this reptile, you know, it hurts. You get nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which only lasts for minutes. As soon as the reptile lets go, the poisoning goes away pretty quickly. People don't die from this particular bite. What the pharmacy companies have done is figured out ways to make the effects of the venom prolonged so that it lasts over a day or a week. And they've turned them into all kinds of drugs that we call GLP-1 agonists, which slow the emptying of the stomach, which change some hormones related to diet and hunger. And that's what they brag about, by the way, is uh, that's how it works. And what happens is people lose weight just like with cancer chemotherapy, the same comparison with the Mayo Clinic article that I showed you that I wrote. You know, they make people sick, they lose weight, so their blood pressure comes down, cholesterol comes down, risk for heart disease comes down, just from losing weight. And they lose 5 to 5 to 10%, maybe more of their body weight. All you have to do is lose 5% for 10, 5 to 10% of your body weight to show a dramatic, significant reduction in risk of dying of heart disease. Anyway, and uh, the desired effects of this type of poisoning, Ozempic, Wegovy, GLP-1 agonist, the desired effects are nausea, diarrhea, decreased appetite, vomiting. That's what they're looking to get, have you? Yet. That's why the other diet works. And the uh, more serious side effects are the ones listed below, like pancreatitis and kidney failure and all kinds of things. But really that's how it works. And, and people people are learning about this, that they're it's making them sick and they lose weight. But I guess it's worth it to some of them, but not all of them, like Christine Gale, a radiologist with Monolulu. She said she quit Mugovi in the summer of 2022. She said the drug left her repulsed by most foods and vomiting near daily. 
I told my husband at one point I would rather starve than feel this way. So this radiologist, age 52 from Honolulu, couldn't take it. She ate again. So this is this is the, the dilemma. Think about it. You can you can um semi-starve and be hungry. You can fully starve and go into ketosis, or you can take drugs to suppress the appetite. The, the, what's coming out is some interesting facts about these GLP-1 drugs. And these are things you could discover, as I did, by originally reading the original papers published. But it's coming out in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and so on about some of the shortcomings. Like, for example, this is the results you're looking at right here in the chart of a, uh, of a study on using these drugs. What they did is in the light gray uh, bar that you see there are the control group, which was uh, the control people were asked to increase their calories by 500 calories a day and exercise. So they got some weight loss. And then they had the group in the dark, dark line that took the GLP-1s and they lost weight. Okay, look, look, they lost like 16, 17% of their body weight. But as you got out to around the 68th week, the sickness, the body says, that's enough, I'm gonna die. So what happens is you stop losing weight you know, because of the survival mechanism of the body, it'll only let you go so far. But you can't go further if they make the poison stronger. But to th this point right now, though you go into a plateau at about uh, at about 68 weeks, and you don't lose any more weight. And you spent $17,000 to lose 37 pounds on average. <laughs> anyway, well, that's what everybody's doing. And uh, businesses are suffering because so many people are taking these drugs. They sell less junk food, less doctor visits, less hospitals. This is anti-money making. So it will ever fly, I don't know. So what proves to you that everything about low-carb diets is wrong is the fact that they are they're only consumed in times of... Uh, well, in the extremes of the environment, you see low-carb diets, like the Inuit Eskimos, et cetera. But most populations, in fact, 99.99% of the people that walk this earth, they live on high-carbohydrate diets. And this, this is, I think, my best argument as to what people should eat. It's because what they have eaten for a million years. It's only been the last 50 years that we've you know, had the popularity of, of low-carb diets. But for a million years, we've been eating things like corn in Central America and Mexico and potatoes in South America and the Andes and bread basket of the world. They consume bread and barley and wheat. And of course, Asia, they consume rice. So, you know, something that you can see you, or certainly can learn quickly proves that this is nonsense. And these populations of people that I'm mentioning, if you think about them, people living on rice, for example, people in China, Japan, Thailand, what do you think? Do you think of fat people, sickly people? Of course not. You know, open your eyes. You know, if, you, if you don't even take the trouble to read the science which I provided for you, open your eyes, look around, and don't put up any, any nonsense from these low carvers. They're, they're doing you and the people around you and the planet. And as far as I'm concerned, they're doing a lot of harm. So stand up and tell them they're wrong. Show them this video. Okay, Jay, we can do, do, do some little food questions, I guess. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Well, that, that's what you wanted me to do. You wanted me to give you the full. I love the lectures. And, you know, I, I thank you for pointing out how it the, the weight that's lost even though quickly on a low-carb diet, is not fat loss. That's what people don't understand. Well, initially... Initially, it's water, but then because you don't eat, you burn fat. But what's found by Kevin Hall's work, which should have destroyed Gary Taubes, this Big Fat Lies book. But, you know, who knows why people persist in their messages. What Kevin Hall showed is that when you restrict fat, you lose uh, more weight than when you restrict carbohydrates, calorie per calorie. So low carb diets are not effective ways to lose weight. There's no metabolic advantage, which is what they brag about 
there's no metabolic advantage to eating a low carb diet over a high carb diet. In fact, it's just the opposite. The metabolic advantage is with a high carb diet. You lose more weight effortlessly doing what is right than doing what is wrong. What is right is to eat the diet for people. That's a diet of starch with the addition of fruits and vegetables. It can, it can include oil if you want a little bit. Fat you eat the fat you wear. So if you're too thin, maybe a few nuts and seeds and avocados would serve you well. But, you know, otherwise the diet is starch, vegetables, and fruit. Uh, the human bo body is a survivor, though, so you get fooled. You know, if you reacted uh, immediately to the poisons that we administer to ourselves, then we wouldn't do things that we do. For example, if you smoke cigarettes, one cigarette caused you to end up on a respirator. Nobody would smoke. If every time you drank a glass of wine, you ended up falling down, breaking your skull open, nobody would do that. It takes years and years of this kind of uh, of slow damage to end up, da you know, damaging you to the point where you do see disease. It's the same thing with food. If every time you took a, a bite of, uh, of of cheesecake, you got chest pain, you wouldn't do it. But because it's subtle and cumulative, we we and we want to believe it. You know, we really want to believe this stuff is good for us. But we end up uh, indulging, and it's wrong, and it's obvious, and you can prove it's obvious. Just do some experiments. You, you know, if you want to prove the strength of your hunger drive, don't eat for the weekend. You can't beat that drive. So what do you do? You satisfy it with high carbohydrate foods because that's what satisfies the hunger drive. I showed you the four basic areas of research. Uh, body doesn't notice fat, and, and that's one of the reasons that fat accumulates so effortlessly. You've got a, a very effective feat, a guy named Flat, back in the 40s and 50s, did this guy, F-L-A-T-T. -T. So Flat did this basic research, which showed that the body has a negative feedback mechanism to deal with carbohydrate. When you eat carbohydrate ca calories, the body, the appetite response notices it and causes the hunger to be satisfied. But when you eat fat, you don't get this kind of feedback. And so as a result, the body keeps accumulating fat. F-L-A-T-T -T is the man's name. And I haven't thought about him in a long time. But anyway, so the body doesn't stop accumulating fat because it doesn't have any feedback. And that's why people can be, you know, average if you're, your feedback mechanism is still working. You maybe gain 30, 40, 50 pounds. But, you know, because fat is so effortlessly accumulated, with no response to the appetite. The appetite does not notice the fat you eat. What happens is you gain 100, 200, 300 pounds of fat. And you see people hobbling around. Most of them are in their home because they can't get out in the world. But that's what fat does for you. Fat, fat is there for, for survival. It's for long-term shortages of food that you may experience naturally in an environment. But in a society where people have plenty of food, the fat has really ended up destroying them and everything around them. So well, low carb is just trying to try trick you into, into their do message. You, do you think people get seduced though by the rapid weight loss initially? So they think that it's, that that's because you know it, it can take a little longer doing it right well it can yeah it can but not much longer i mean you, you lose just like in kevin hall's research he showed that people you know quite quickly and like in, in six six days actually his his results were within six days and he showed the weight loss over months you know just a few months that occurred so yeah, you you initially you get really excited because you tip the scale maybe six pounds in the first three, four, five days. So you go, wow, wow, and I get to eat all the foods that I love. Well, okay, you, you you're not really eating all the foods you love. You're eating foods that are killing you, that are covered up with things that you love, like salt and sugar and spice. You don't eat boiled chicken. You have to cover it up with sweet and sour sauce or barbecue sauce because it's not your food. You know, plain and simple, it's not your food. What's your food? Could you sit down and eat a baked potato or a sweet potato or a bowl of rice and beans? What do you think? Huh? Would that repulse you? 
I don't think so. <laughs> ah, this is so simple, but you know. I would love to have Kevin Hall on the show. You introduced me to him, but he never responded because that research is incredible for proving the point that you've been trying to make all these years. But you do have some detractors into saying that you're, and, and I'm not one of them, just so you know, that saying your diet is too low fat and it's too dangerous to go so low fat. What happens when you go too low fat? I, I've never seen a thing. I've never seen it. I, the only, I do a lecture on uh, fat deficiency to show you how near impossible it is to go low, too low fat. And what I tell you about is how... Um, is how uh, the experiments done to show fat deficiency were carried out in the 1920s and 30s. What they did in the 1920s is they introduced formula to replace human breast milk as the modern thing to do. The first formulas they introduced were full, full fat dairy products, full fat milk, and the kids got really fat. And so what they decided to do was put them on no fat dairy products and they developed fatty acid deficiency. You know, they have dry skin, sores at the end of the mouth, eventually failure to grow, fatigue, fatty acid deficiency. But that's the only case that natural that well, uh, that it only occurred under experimental situations. The other e evidence that fat uh, needs are so small they're basically impossible to reach. The good grief, uh, potatoes are well, rice is eight percent fat, oatmeal sixteen percent. You know, beans are like four or five percent fat. So there's plenty of fat in these foods. Anyway, and people who have intestinal problems, uh, say they have uh, uh, gone through an accident or an autoimmune disease, and they've lost their whole small intestine. Now you can keep people alive uh, through by feeding through a intravenous needle a watery solution that has carbohydrate, protein, vitamins, minerals, etc. But you can't give the fat through the needle. Because, you know, the globs of fat would form, form on top and cause fat emboli. So you can't do that. So what we used to do is take safflower oil and rub it on the forearm of the person. And that corrected fatty acid deficiency, just that small amount of fat rubbed on like three times a week and in a couple of weeks. Sort through the skin. I mean, it, it's impossible to develop fatty acid deficiency on any natural diet. You can't do it. Just like it's impossible to develop protein deficiency. But of course, it's easy to develop uh, vitamin C deficiency. But you know about vitamin C, and that's because vitamin C is uh, ascorbic acid, which is in plants. Yeah. Anyway. What they say so that you, the people that yeah. went too low fat developed dementia later in life. That's uh, so again nonsense. People, people who say that, Chef AJ, the the few that I followed up on sell supplements of essential fats in the background make a ton of money. But the research doesn't support that. Uh, you get, and also the other excuse that they use, and you know, I do a whole lecture on this if anybody wants to look it up, is they, um, they, they tell you that the human being cannot convert ALA, alpha linolenic acid, which is made by plants, ALA, it's omega-3 fat, only made by plants, no animal makes it, only seaweed and algae and the tomato plants and potato plants make this. This omega-3 fat, they say the ALA can can be converted into longer chains of fatty acid, such as icosapentaenoic acid or uh, DHA, which is another derivative. So EPA and DHA. That's not true. The human being is very efficient at doing this. But plenty of plenty of conversion to take place. You know what would prove it to you with just a simple observation that terrestrial populations, in other words, people, populations that were raised outside of an environment of the sea, the ocean of fish, which has been the primary source of omega-3 fats. Of course, fish got the omega-3 fats from eating seaweed and algae. Uh, what you would have to say is that you couldn't develop normal populations or uh, with any brain development if they didn't have contact with the sea. Well, that's not true. I, Millions and millions of people have de developed in terrestrial settings with no 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 access to concentrated omega-3 fats. Anyway, the science is really clear, and I've gone over the science with you. 
they, these folks, they're distorting the truth. And uh, I, I don't know what you could say. All you can say is that that a low carb, a low fat, high carbohydrate, starch based diet hurts, hurts, as I told you in the beginning of this presentation, it hurts the food industry, the drug industry, your doctor's income, the hospital's income. Yeah, it does hurt things. You're probably the clothing industry. You won't have to buy as big of clothes. And the, the deodorant industry, because you won't stink as bad. And uh, the laxative industry, because you can have now have a normal bowel movement. I mean, this 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 revolution to convert from a, a belief that animal foods and oils have tremendous economic consequences. I mean, look what Ozempic did just in a, in a few months. It, it set the food industry on its heels because people are consuming less food and they'll consume less blood pressure pills, fewer, fewer diabetic medications because they will not have eaten the poison. They'll eat less poisons. Poisons are two, two food poisons, animal products and oil. Not the oil that's in the banana or in the orange or in the potato or in the oatmeal, but the oil that has been extracted from the plant parts and made into corn oil, safflower oil, rice oil, et cetera. You don't eat those things. It's, you know, that's not, you want to eat starch with the addition of fruits and vegetables. When you talk about a low-fat diet, how low are you proposing? Is there a certain lowness well, a person has to achieve for weight loss, for example? Well, the, the diet was designed without my input. You know, these, these, whatever they, whoever, whatever they were designed the diet millions of years ago, or at least a million years ago, probably four, five, five million years ago. And the diet for human beings was put together and we've been following ever since then. So um, I don't, what was the question again, AJ? How low fat, low, how low does low fat have a, to be? A natural diet designed by God, <laughs> nature whatever, it's, it's about 7% fat. 7% of the calories are fat. Uh, Nathan Pritikin used to teach 10%. It's in the ballpark. Nathan Pritikin also was afraid. And I know, I knew the man. He was afraid to recommend what he really knew to be true. And he compromised by adding a little, a little animal food, skim milk, and he gave his participants a little chicken or fish once a week because he felt he would uh, cause him less criticism. And of course, I've done that too. I made that compromise in the sense that I tell people I have turkey every other Thanksgiving. <laughs> AJ, nobody asked me about about what I did a couple of weeks ago. Well, I, that was actually my next question. How was your Thanksgiving, and what did you have? It was wonderful, and uh, uh, there was a turkey near near enough by me to I could have grabbed a, a piece of its winger. Taylor button, but I didn't. I, they, there were so many mashed potatoes, and I got past the mashed potatoes and the dressing and the muffins and the gravy and the green beans. And by the time we got to that dried up old piece of uh, white meat, I just, I didn't bother. But, I, but maybe next Thanksgiving I will, or there's always Christmas. We might end up at somebody's house that has a turkey at Christmas. Do you even like animal products, Dr. McDougall? I don't like them. No, I don't think they taste good. Do you think they taste good? Well, I, I haven't had them in almost 50 years, and I didn't think they tasted good then, nor would I want to have them now. You know, I used to I used to sit at the dinner table. And I used to sit at the dinner table, and my mom, of course, served plenty of meat, particularly steaks and roast beef and stuff. And I would cut this up with a steak knife, and just small pieces, and I would chew. And I would chew, and I would chew, and chew. I couldn't. I couldn't get it to get it to break down to um, a small piece to swallow. And so what I did is I would take the, the chewed up piece of meat and I would take it and feed it to Bonnie, my dog, sitting here next to my chair when I was a little kid. And uh, you know, if my mother said something to me, she'd say, "Well, Johnny, you know, why are you feeding your the meat to your dog?" And I said, "I should have said to my mom, I can't chew it, mom." The reason I can't chew it is it's got the wrong wrong kind of teeth. 
but Bonnie, my little little boxer, little girl boxer down here, she didn't have any trouble at all, not a bit. She got the right, that's that's her food. You know, I had no trouble with the mashed potatoes, no trouble with the corn. You know, I swallowed the rice, no oatmeal and the vegetables and the fruits, and but I just couldn't get this this piece of flesh masticated. There must have been something wrong. What was wrong? I had the wrong set of teeth. Huh? And for you people who say that we are omnivores because we have canine teeth, look in the mirror. I don't see any canine teeth. I've never, I used to talk at dental conventions. I've talked to you know, several thousand people several times a year. And I would ask the dentist, have you ever seen teeth in a person's mouth that looks like a cat's teeth? You ever seen any of these sharp, pointy things? Even, even our closest relative, which is the chimpanzee, or you know, some people say other other species of primates, but even our closest relatives has four prominent canine teeth for catching animals. We don't have those. And yet everybody who studies these these particular lesser primates say concludes that they're vegan. You know, their diet is a starch-based diet. But they have, you know, they, they if anything, you can argue that a chimpanzee is designed to catch little rodents because of the teeth. We're not designed to catch little rodents or, or big cows. That's not our, that's why people are sick. It's a food. Fat is in breast milk, Dr. McDougall. I'm sorry, can you say again? Breast milk. How much, in human breast milk, how much, what percentage is, is that fat? Fifty percent. So, if we need all this fat, why wouldn't there? Why wouldn't there be more fat in breast milk at a time when it's, you? Would think because you're doubling in size every three to six months. You've got a lot of a lot of things to lay down. The kind of fat you lay down depends upon the kind you eat. And so, if you're on a cow's milk diet, you're eating mostly saturated fat, and your baby is not getting as many essential fats as he the little baby should, which come from plants. So you may have fat in your breast milk. And, but when you hit to be two or three years of age, uh, the National Institutes of Health recommends that you put children on a low fat diet, but not until then. Children are designed to be on a high fat diet during their initial months of life, which is called human breast milk. But they're also designed to be on a low protein diet because, because the diet is only 5% protein. So it's a high fat, low protein, high carbohydrate diet that breast milk is. As time goes on, you need less fat you know, after the first few months of life. The, the nervous system pretty much is laid down by five years of age. But the, the NIH says that at about two or two years of age, you should start thinking about cutting the fat down in the child's diet because there's so much obesity in little children these days. And all the fat you need for a kid is in the basic diet. When look at look at there a billion Chinese, or you know a billion Asians lived on rice. Ninety percent of their diet was rice. Do you think they didn't develop adequate brains? You know, consider World War II. We almost lost that war. Consider the Vietnamese conflict. We lost that one against rice eaters. They eat low fat. They feed their babies breast milk from mothers that eat a high carbohydrate, high starch diet. So it's uh, it's never never a problem. Uh, breast milk is perfect for human babies, but of course the milk of animals varies based upon the growth of the animal. And there's a chart I show where <clears throat> people babies double in size in six months, and the protein content of the milk is very very low, like 1.2 grams for every 100 grams of milk. And I show a cow. Cow's milk has three times as much protein, but they grow three times as fast. And a, a dog, seven times as much protein in their milk. But a dog doubles in size in you know, a few days, or you know, not very long. And then a baby rat, uh, they have 11 times more protein in their milk for their babies, and they double in size in four and a half days, you know, compared to a human baby, which grows slowly, takes six months. So the, the milk of a mammal is based upon the needs of the animal. And that's why when scientists study 
the diet of a particular mammal, they start with the breast milk of that mammal and they see what the young needed. And then they extrapolate as to what the adult's diet should be. If it's slow growth animal, like the human is, you, you become an adult at age 17. That's you're supposed to. I know you get accelerated growth from the Western diet, but you're supposed to be 17 years old. Uh, an adult rat is like four months old when they become an adult. So nature takes care of its own, really. It's been doing it for millions of years. Dr. McDougall, one of the live viewers named Sharon is saying, I'm 73 and just found out I have fatty liver. My doctor said I need to follow the Mediterranean diet and I need to cut out carbohydrates, including potatoes. Well, the first suggestion was pretty good. It's obvious the doctor knows nothing about the Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet is a higher carbohydrate, lower fat, lower animal food diet, which people have focused on being a diet high in olive oil and nuts. My comment is the Mediterranean diet is healthy in spite of the olive oil and nuts. The, the uh, It's called the Pretty Med study, which is the study of the Mediterranean diet, was sponsored by, by uh, three companies that own olive oil businesses for, and uh, one company that owns a, from California that owns a nut, nut business. They're the ones that sponsored this study to show the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet, which is the diet of people around the Mediterranean Sea, post-World War II particularly, particularly among the Cretans from the Cretan Islands, you know, near Italy, Crete, yeah. Or oh, after World War II, they ate a diet that was almost identical to the McDougal diet. And so out of that understanding of post-World War II, out of Ansel Key's work, out of studying people from Crete, post-World War II, developed the Mediterranean diet, which is a high vegetable, high starch diet that have, they, they can seed to a little fish, a little, little salmon, and nuts and seeds and olives. So, you know, your doctor told you that, but then to follow it up with the idea that I eat a little carbohydrate diet, that's not the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet is like our diet in that direction. They just don't go far enough. They make compromises to make people happy. I never felt the need to do that. I felt the need to make them happy from the results. In other words, in other words, uh, if I tell you something, it better be the best I know because otherwise you're not going to get the best results. And that's what we teach. We, we have a 12 day program, as all of you know. Teach it worldwide. It's done through the internet. Our medical director will see you day one. And then we run you through 12 days of intensive education supervision and medical direction to tell you how you get off your med your diabetic medications and your blood pressure medications and what needs to be added and fixed and so on. We do that for you in 12 days at a very reasonable cost, actually about a third of what we used to charge <clears throat> or what used to cost people for the resort and or the hospital program I ran. So it's a, it's a deal. We, we run another one in about a month or so. 12 days, change your life. Yeah. Do you have any openings? I, I put the link in the show notes, but do you have any openings, Dr. McDougal? I think we do for January. Okay. Uh, I know it's at least half, last time I heard Heather say it was at least half sold. Could be, could be. Well, you know, okay. the holidays, interesting. the holidays are times when people don't think about getting healthy. Can you believe that? That would be the most important time. I read somewhere that most heart attacks occur on Christmas day than, than any other day of the year. I wouldn't be surprised. But one thing that did surprise me was all of all the years we've been doing this, which have been at least 35 years now, that our January programs, the ones where people should be asking to pay penance for all their sinning done during the, their dietary sinning done during the, the holidays, Thanksgiving to Christmas, that they ought to attend our, our program. But our, one of our least attended programs has been the one right after the holidays. So it's a good time to get in. You know, New Year's resolution. Say you're not going to do that anymore. We'll help you. Not that do that, do that anymore. Well, our last program was, was more than full, which we ran last month. One of the viewers is asking about when you interviewed Robert Atkins. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that was uh, back in 2000. I was involved in a great nutrition debate. You can still find it on the Internet. 
Dean Arnish invited me to come to Washington to be on a panel with he and Atkins and a few other uh, prominent nutritional people. And I was honored. You know, there were probably six or eight of us on, on panel. And I was one of the people invited. And so uh, I prepared for the, the debate. And as I was preparing, I put together a slide presentation, which it's just as relevant today, 40 years later, 43 years later, as it was when I gave it. What I talked about is how rich foods make people sick. And then I told Mary, as I was preparing the presentation, you know, Mary, my partner, I, I told her, I said, you know, there's going to be some point where Atkins says, and Atkins sat right next to me during the presentation, when Atkins is going to say his diet is very effective and easy to follow. And I said, Mary, when Robert Atkins says that, it would have like 500 cameras pointing at us. When Robert Atkins says that, I'm going to say, okay, Dr. Atkins, stand up, take off your coat, and show us how effective the diet really is. And Mary said, you can't do that. And to this day, I regret not doing that. You, you, did, that. you did that. Huh? huh? You did that once at a conference we both spoke at, remember, recently? Where you well, I did that. Yeah, but I also did it with Barry Sears back in Boston. Is uh, They dropped my slides on the floor. And I said, what are we going to do, Barry, for the next 10 or 15 minutes while they put my slides back together to entertain the thousand people sitting here? And I said, uh, Barry, why don't we take off our shirts, show people what the diet really does? And he just kind of laughed. He wouldn't do it, of course. Because he was fat. All these low carbers are overweight and sickly looking. Not all of them, but most of them. There's actually a presentation I did, which you can find on the internet. It's a, about a five minute uh, video, which talks about low carb versus high carb gurus. And it shows you Lauren Cordain, and Sally Fallon, and, uh, and uh, Barry Sears, and Robert Atkins. I showed their pictures. I, right there, you could look, you just see them. I showed their pictures. They recommend low carb diets that are fat and sick looking. And Lauren Cardane, which he's the paleo guy, hardly looked like he could make it off stage. Looked so sick. Then I showed Neil Bernard and Carl Esselstyn and myself, et cetera. And I said, This is what happens if you follow a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Open your eyes. I don't know. It's, it's, it's seen a few hundred thousand views, but you can look it up. It's, uh, I think it's called low carb versus. I can find it. I, I think it's on veg source. Yeah, I've, I'll be able to find that. What were they like, these individuals? Were they confrontational? Did they really believe in their diet? Uh, they did a lot of lying. <laughs> a lot of the, the things that I remember about dealing, and I haven't done as many confrontations as I probably could have and should have. But what I remember is they cherry picked the science. You know, they'll look at a particular study and they won't understand what the issues are. And, you know, it, it, people have a tendency to do that, to cherry pick. And and I, I wouldn't ask you to, to excuse me as being a person who doesn't do that. But I think what you need to look at is is the logic and the, the majority or minority of the opinion strength and, and uh, how, how really relevant it is and what it's going to cost you. One of the, one of the things that I've... I've, I've uh, recommended to people is that you're going to have lots of lots of advice on <clears throat> how to make money and how to become healthier, have a better life, and so on. And, and not being an expert, you know, you're not a financial advisor or a dietitian, et cetera. You know, how do you evaluate a lot of these recommendations? It's hard. Well, the first thing is make sure that whatever they're saying is not going to ruin you financially or physically, in other words, kill you. And then you give it a test and you look at the, what they're asking. You decide whether you're willing to risk, take the risk of money, time, and effort to put it to the test to see what works. And what you do is you follow this person's recommendations, keep in mind what they told you is going to happen, and give it four months, see whether it works. You know, you, you give us seven days 12 at the most, which is what our telemedicine program is. And you will have absolutely no doubt that you've discovered the truth. It's the food. It doesn't cost you anything either. In fact, everything, everything that I share with you is free on our website. 
at drmcdougall.com, including a 12-day program, which we put in 30 years ago. And the, the truth don't change. It's the same program we've been teaching for, well, let's see, 40, 47 years now. It's amazing. Linda and I'm still Flynn. alive, and I'm still alive, and Robert Atkins isn't. <laughs> yeah, and and, and well, the, you have a funny story. Well, and I don't know if it's funny about with with his autopsy and his his widow. Well, this was this was a uh, uh, this happened with Neil Bernard and I. You know, Neil Bernard, the physician, physicians committee for responsible medicine. I believe the 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 doctor's name was Flynn from Kansas City. Uh, I could be correct on that. It's been 25 years. So <laughs> when Atkins died, uh, it was in New York. And as I remember the details, it was April. And he, the excuse was he slipped on the ice and as a result uh, died of, I don't know, whatever, his fall. But the truth of the matter is, is he had a heart failure and then he fell. There was no ice at the, on that day in New York City in April. Uh, he was, uh, he died. The year before, he had a near fatal episode of cardiac failure, but he recovered. So all of a sudden, he didn't have cardiac failure. He dropped in, fall on the ice. It was, like I say, it's, yeah, I don't believe it's true. But anyway, um, after he died, Neil Bernard and I went on a campaign. I was uh, on the front page of the New York Times, I was on Neil Cavoto's show. Uh, North, I don't know. Anyway, I was on a whole bunch of the shows. And um, as a result, uh, we talked about the autopsy. It wasn't actually an autopsy. It was a medical report that the um, that uh, this, this doctor from Kansas City, I think his name was Flynn, uh, obtained for us. And what this medical report showed was that Atkins was obese, based on his body weight. He had a history of high blood pressure. Of, uh, I happened to get a hold of his angiograms and he had horrible atherosclerosis, even though he said he didn't have any artery disease. That's not what his angiogram showed. Anyway, uh, as a result, we went on a campaign and we talked about how these low carbohydrate diets are dangerous. This again was you know 20 plus years ago and nobody's made any significant changes. The result was that Veronica Atkins, his wife, came after Neil Bernard and I. Uh, first thing they did is they went to HIPAA, which uh, is a privacy uh, law we have in this country, a, a good law. And they accused us of violating HIPAA, which we never did. We never talked about private information of Atkins. He was never my patient. This is all public information. <laughs> and then what he did, she did is behind my back, she went to my, after my state Hawaii license. I never heard about it, not for a couple of years. And uh, when I did hear about it, you know, I uh, said, let's make a public debate of this. And anyway, it, it all turned out. Nothing ever happened. She got on Larry King's show and called Neil and our uh, vegan Nazis. He died of his own diet. Died at what? 70, 71. That's something... I, I haven't heard much from Lawrence Cordain or Barry Sears lately. Have you? No. No, I, yeah. I don't know what, what health is. The, the uh, low fat guy I, I keep hearing be, from Barry is, is hmm? do you know do you know Dr. Eric Westman? He's the one I keep hearing about because he has yeah, a well he's he's one of the him and Yancey and a few other people are are folks that have been incorporated since the beginning on these low carb diets. And they they just exaggerate what the truth is. They make up things. For example, they say you know, eating sugar, uh, eating sugar uh, feeds cancer. Well, you know, ketones feed cancer. You know, these byproducts of fat metabolism feed cancer. And we've got good research on that. The research on sugar feeding cancer is weak to say the most. And it's distorted to say the least. They talk about Otto Warburg and how, you know, the idea that sugar feeds cancer is based on his work. Not the way I read his work on respiration and cancer, Otto Warburg. But anyway, uh, yeah, they're pretty powerful. I don't know how much they get from industry, but I would be surprised if uh, their efforts were, they certainly should be as far as the, what the benefit is concerned. Well, I'll look, I should look that up. I don't. 
I don't know that I really want to get involved in that, on that basis, so. I bet you Eric Westman would. Keep, would let's keep it to the science. Let's keep it to Kevin Hall's work. Let's keep it to the science, all right? Let's, let's. So Dr. McDougall, you gave a wonderful talk many years ago called The Fat Vegan. And there's many people that are vegan that are not eating animal products, but they're still overweight. Why do you think they have such a hard time lowering the amount of fat that they eat? Well, I, I actually wrote a, an article about, again, it was about 20 years ago. Excuse me, and I carried it over in the book called The Starch Solution. And what I talked about in there is I have a chapter called The Fat Vegan. That uh, that I would have got I got a lot of negative feedback from me saying that, but I didn't. I guess because of the way I approached it, it seems like an oxymoron to say fat vegan, but it doesn't seem to be because there are an awful lot of fat vegans out there. In fact, I was uh, asked to be a speaker at the Worldwide Vegan Conference again. That was about fifteen years ago, and. Uh, I, you know, the story about me eating turkey or every Thanksgiving came up and they wanted to know if that was true. And I said, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and uh, what I was planning on doing, and I, I think they heard about it, but I was trying to plan on having the audience there, of, you know, a few hundred people and saying to them, how many of you are vegan? And have them stand up. And I'd say to their neighbors, now look around you at the people who declare themselves vegan. What do you see? What you see is half the people are overweight. So why is that? I mean, these are people who are of, of a high conscious value. They're concerned about the earth and the animals. And, you know, they're really strong people. These vegans are because they stand up against dietitians and mother-in-laws and up against the world by saying you shouldn't eat meat. So we're dealing with a really powerful, high class group of people. Those are who are vegan, but, but they're also fat vegans. And the problem is when you stand up to convey your important messages about the world and about the animals, people look at you and go, you mean I have to look like that yeah. to save the world, to save the planets? No, you need to look as an example of strength and personal appearance and health and then sell your message. And it's so simple because you've already given up the animal foods. You just have to give up the oils. Fat vegans are fat vegans because they buy into nuts and seeds and avocados and peanut butters and almond butters and cheesecakes made of almond butters. And, you know, they uh, they buy into these fake foods, which are high fat, often like your fake cheeses are like 90 percent oil. And so they ended up being fat vegans. And I, again, I've not received any negative comments about me approaching it from this viewpoint. I, I really want people who have made the, any of these steps in the right direction to join me, but, but do it in a powerful manner. I mean, look like, look like a vegan diet is worth the wild. You personally look strong and trim and healthy. And then tell people about the abuse of animals and about the dying planet. So that's why I wrote the uh, the, the uh, newsletter article, and that's why I wrote the chapter in the book. And I think that I've gotten all positive, but maybe you guys just don't want to hurt my feelings. <laughs> I don't know. I searched on your website and I or your YouTube channel, and I found the video that you're referring to comparing the low-carb eaters with the plant eaters, and I posted that in the chat in the show notes. And I also found a radio interview you did with Robert Atkins. You know, there's one of those two. And as I remember, he I had Atkins on my radio show twice. I, I lost one of the interviews in the fires, as I lost almost everything. But I preserved one interview that I did. And, you know, what Atkins said is, he, he said, and this has happened in conference situations too. He said, well, our diet, we improve blood sugar, cure diabetes, lower blood pressure, people lose weight. I said, yeah, yeah, but your patients are also all constipated and have bad breath, and your research shows that. And, and, and pretty much everybody in the medical community thinks your diet is dangerous. What's changed in the last, whatever, 20 years since I did that radio interview is my colleagues have gone rogue. They've gone over to believe this guy. 
and abandoned the science, the truth, and their patients have suffered by enrolling themselves medical doctors, people who are supposed to be intelligent, like Westman and Yancey. And I don't know how these people can sleep or wake up in the morning and look themselves in the mirror. Well, I think they believe it. I think they believe what they're saying. Well, you know, they they do, but the science is pretty darn clear. I mean, deal with the four research meta-analysis papers that I showed you, which showed that these low-carb diets increase your chances of dying and dying of heart disease. All four of them. Show them those. Show them the recent study that uh, shows middle age and older people will live about 10 years less if they eat a low-carb diet. You know, the research is there. You could jump up and down and talk about the the metabolic advantage and ignore Hall's work if you want. You know, you you can ignore and try and discredit the last 100 years on the association between artery damage and the high fat, high cholesterol diet if you want. You know, you can ignore all the stuff on uh, trimethylamine if you want. You know, you can ignore a lot of things and you find a public out there wanting to hear good news about their bad habits. Oh, doctor, just just tell me I don't have to give up my my beef jerky, please. Well, they're there to tell you that. That's not true. You know, people who, who by circumstance follow a low carb diet <clears throat> are sick people too, you know, in their natural environment. Like, for example, the Inuit Eskimo. The Inuit Eskimo was a, a small population of people, maybe 50,000 individuals, you know, dating back a long time, you know, a thousand years, 2000, a long time ago. They lived up in that part of the world. And to survive in that part of the world, they had to eat from their environment. What's in their environment? There are mammals like seals and bears, and there 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 are whales, and you know there are fish, but but there are no plants, except for a couple of months during the summertime, when they go off the Atkins diet. Otherwise, all they're all year long, they're on a, a low carb, high fat, high protein diet. The people that live in that part of the world, well. Traditionally, I mean, I'm talking about before they switch to the Western diet. On their native diet, they have the highest incidence of osteoporosis in the world. Weakest bones. They have uh, uh, they have atherosclerosis, which dates back 500 years in these people. They had rotten arteries. Uh, they have a high rate of infectious disease because of the parasites that are transferred from uh, from the animal flesh, the fish. The uh, anyway, it, it, it's it's a diet you can survive on, but that's the extremes of the environment. Are you know people like the Inuit Eskimo, and of course the Inuit Eskimo is in really bad trouble now. The Inuit Eskimo, by the way, used to have to hunt for their their food, and they used to live in igloos, which were cold. And the Inuit Eskimo burnt somewhere between three and 7,000 calories a day. The Eskimo of today lives in heated homes and they drives around in heated SUVs. And when they go fishing, they fish with a green lure. They go up, they go through the, the, the fast food drive-in restaurant and the person opens the window and they hand them a green lure. And they said, I would like a fish. So they fish these. uh, Anyway, they're they're among the sickest people on this planet, the Inuit Eskimo. Diabetes rates, obesity rates, dental problems, heart disease, cancers. Their breast milk is so so infected, uh, so contaminated with environmental poisons because they live on they live on animals, which because of biomagnification. They have bioaccumulated high doses of poisons so that the breast milk of an Inuit woman is so toxic, it has been recommended that they be buried in toxic waste dumps. The leftover milk be buried in toxic waste dumps. 
So you you know low carb diets, all, all the things I just shared with you are are things that you don't want to hear. If you want to hear good news about your bad habits, but it's the truth. Well, you know what's anyway. interesting, Doctor McDougal, is people that go on these low carb diets off always have to cheat to eat carbs. But when you're on the starch solution, you don't really have to cheat. Well, you don't have you satisfy your hunger. Remember, I showed you it's carbohydrates, starch, sugar that satisfies your hunger drive. It's just like oxygen satisfies your breathing. You know, you can make a mixture of gases and leave out oxygen. You're huffing and puffing and dead in three minutes. So it's oxygen. It's, it's, it's carbohydrate that satisfies the hunger drive. If you leave carbohydrate out, the body doesn't recognize that you've eaten. Eh, it does a little bit, but not the real strong stimulus to satiety. The stimulus of satiety comes from getting energy that your body's designed to utilize. It's called glycolysis, glucose, glycolysis. You learned that in high school. You learned it in junior high. That's what the body burns for energy. It's sugar. And sugar should come from beans, rice, corn, and potatoes. You know, it shouldn't come from table sugar. But even if it does, it's not as toxic as, as people claim. Uh, table sugar will rot your teeth. Raise your triglycerides. It's uh, empty calories. Eat enough of it, you can get into pretty big trouble. But enough, how much I would have to eat half your diet is table sugar. So Dr. I don't want you to eat half your diet is table sugar. So don't eat, don't do don't even say that. Nope. Well, I just I love when you talk about Dr. Walter Kempner's diet and when we've had Dr. Grimm on because people are you know, because when they do have blood sugar issues, they do seem improvements at first when they go on a low carb diet, you know? Well, AJ, that's because of short sightedness. <clears throat> Meat has no sugar, no carbohydrate. Uh, cheese, 2% of the calories are carbohydrate. Oil, no carbohydrate. So you, you're, you're eating uh, f foods without any sugar in it. So when you eat these foods, your blood sugar does not go up. But you do damage to your body to the point where you develop insulin resistance and you chronically develop high elevated blood sugars and it's called type 2 diabetes. When people who are, are diabetic, type 1 or type 2, switch to our diet, they're all of a sudden inter introducing sugar back into their diet. So their blood sugars go up. It's supposed to. But in time, if you give the body a chance, if you're a type two diabetic or even type one and a half, you give the body a chance, you'll revert to, to metabolism where you can handle the sugar and your blood sugars become normal. How often do you cure type two diabetes? Now listen to me carefully, because I can win this, this argument if you have any challenge, is you can, you can cure type two diabetes with weight loss. And our diet is the best diet for weight loss, essentially 100% of the time. So, you know, uh, if, if you're, what you're looking to her is a, a, a better blood sugar hours after you change your diet, eat meat, doesn't have any sugar in it. If you're interested in long-term losing the weight, lowering your cholesterol, improving your bowel movements, stopping the indigestion, then eat a starch-based diet and cure yourself of diabetes. Your choice. But I, but I know that people are, are into immediate gratification, so they get discouraged. We had, in our last program, we had a lady the first day, same thing. I mean, she was upset because her blood sugar went up. And, uh, you know, she my guess was uh, she weighed a lot more than she could or should. And I said, just give it just give it the 12 days, see what happens. And she got off all her insulin, all her diabetic pills, and had a blood sugar better than when she started in 12 days. That's what you should expect. That's what the program causes you to accomplish in a short period of time. You can't expect for all full benefits to be realized until you hit trend body weight. But immediately, within 12 days, we get 90% of people. That's what our data shows. We publish data that shows within, within seven days, we get seven days we get nearly 90% of people 
to reduce or stop their medications, particularly their diabetic and blood pressure medicine. So you start the program on these pills and shots, you end the program off of them or a reduced dose 90% of the time in seven days. So anyway, the body heals rapidly. Uh, one of the things that takes some time is the weight loss. And it takes about, you can probably figure out about eight to 16 pounds a month. And until you get down to trim body weight, which is the weight that AJ loves to look at, which is Kempner's trim body weight chart, right? You love that, don't you? I think I actually make it now, Dr. McDougal. When I when I saw you in Palm Springs, I actually think I finally made that chart. <laughs> well, Mary and I both fit that chart. Uh, yeah. well, my November 2015 newsletter <clears throat> has Walter Kempner's ideal weights in it. And, and I put them there because I didn't want you to get upset when you thought you lost too much weight. When you come from being chronically pudgy, generous in size, when that's your normal habitus, and that's the way you look at yourself and people look at you, when you lose weight, sometimes people misunderstand. They think maybe you're sick, maybe you got cancer or AIDS. They don't understand you did it by getting healthier. And you may have some worry too, that maybe you're losing too much weight. Well, that's why I refer you to the Kempner weight charts in my November 2015 newsletter. Just look at the end of the newsletter. You'll see the charts is to reassure you that you haven't lost too much weight. And if you think, still think you have, you can put it on back on fairly safely by eating nuts and seeds and avocados. So that's why the chart's there. But, you know... <clears throat> I I I now am at a weight that Kempner would have been pleased at. But for a good share of my life, I was a little heavier. And I don't mind telling you why. Uh, I, I had to travel around the country to sell books for 15 years. And uh, the traveling was hard. And I had to be in a different hotel in a different city every day. You know, sometimes 10 days in a row. And that was a lot of effort to get the right kinds of foods, you know, oil-free this and et cetera. And uh, anyway, that was that was one of the way, reasons that I was probably 20 or 30 pounds heavier than I am now. But my top weight was like 80 to 90 pounds heavier than I am now. I was cute. But Mary, actually, Mary, Mary fell, I don't think she fell in love with me. I took her, I figured her a long time for that. But when she met me, she was attracted enough to me uh, to allow me more time with her. And at that point, I believed when we got married, I weighed about 190 pounds, which is a good 50, 60 more than I weigh now. Well, you were so handsome. She overlooked any pudginess. It was my personality. It was, it was my kind, gentle, politically correct first step. <laughs> but Mar Mary was always trim, right? Mary never struggled. She with was. Her. She got she got to a point uh, where she probably carried an extra 10 or 15 pounds. And she doesn't now. But and again, it was it was it wasn't because the principles don't work. It was just that our life was pretty busy at that time, <clears throat> sending us into a lot of circumstances that didn't give us the kind of control we wanted. Or could have, besides that, you know, when you're younger, you think you're invincible, and you know it doesn't apply to me, but it does. So you know, these days uh, it, we take our health less for granted, and we try and apply all those things that people have been telling us for years. Get a little exercise every day, get enough sunshine, eat the right kind of food. Like last night, we did the show at five o'clock last night, so we do every Sunday night. And Mary and I and Heather have a, a free YouTube channel where we get on and we talk about uh, different health issues that we talk about. We answer people's questions every Sunday night, five o'clock Pacific time, the McDougal channel. And uh, last last night we we talked about uh, all all kinds of things. Uh, I talked about artery disease and you know, different medical problems, and it gives us a chance to answer questions. But anyway, I always tell them about the fact that I'm going to get a chance to do your show on Monday morning. And please come and join us. But last night we talked a little bit about plaque rupture and what the current science is talking about. <clears throat> Thank you for doing that, by the way. Dr. McDougall, I pulled up the Kempner weight charts on your website. And what confuses me about it 
is it said that the weight should be be below the number it says it doesn't say how much below and it also says fully dressed and i mean i've worn clothes here in northern california like that weigh a lot more than skimpy clothes i wore in the desert so how do you adjust for that well uh, what he recommends is that you weigh 10 to 15 percent lower if you have heart disease or diabetes etc that's i don't know whether that's present in the chart but that's part of the chart's recommendation uh I um, guess he assumed the average dressed person in North Carolina and Durham would be the clothes that you should consider. But you're right. You know, there's some variable in there. I, I would say I would say there's a better way to tell whether you need to lose weight or not. And how how is that, AJ? How do uh, I tell people? Well, you tell them to take off their shirt and look in the mirror. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah. Dr. Take, Me take, take off your clothes and look in the mirror. You can tell whether you need to lose weight or not. You know. You know, you don't need a chart. You don't need any any fancy formulas. Just are you happy with the way you look? Yeah. And if you're not, and but these days, that's the thing. That's the problem these days is the norms of what's beautiful have been changing. What's personally attractive have been changing. And I know that because the way I see advertisements, the actors and advertisements changing. It used to be, you know, all actors were trim and active and now, now we have, uh, well, like the Ozempic lady who, who runs around singing this song about her diabetic medication. She dances. She's fat. You know, and we all have uh, this song. I think it's Ozempic. Uh, this no. jing, what, what is it? Jar, uh, Jardia, Mary? Jardia. Oh, it's Jardia. It's the Jar, Jar, Jardia, the diabetic dancing girl. That's a diet. That's another diabetic pill. Anyway, the actors... Uh, are overweight because they're talking to an overweight customer base and that's who they relate to and so maybe maybe it is maybe, maybe fat is beautiful i mean i've been told that for my whole career too is you shouldn't have fat phobia john fat's beautiful now fat people are well if it's so beautiful to be, to be fat then why don't you have a term for overweight that sounds good you know, I start out this lecture on obesity by using all the terms that I could find or think of to describe this condition. And nothing seems pleasant. You know, if I call you fat, overweight, obese, rotund, pudgy, chubby, you know, what, what terms do you have that makes it sound like it's a, an attractive condition to be in? You got, you got one to well, I've heard two. One, one is pleasantly plump. One is round around the edges, fluffy. And in Jewish, we always used to say zaftig. No, I'm sure, I'm sure this can be a positive thing, though. Yeah. I mean, anyway. So, Dr. McDougall, one of the live viewers is saying, what about refined flour or even bread? Is that as problematic as sugar or is the fact that it has no fat still benign? Well, that's important. You know, sourdough bread, of course, is a highly refined bread with that's zero fat. And so sourdough bread, I think, has had a lot of place in low carb diets. I'm sorry, low fat diets, high carb diets, like Pritikin used to recommend it. <clears throat> the more refining of the bread, the worse off you're going to be. The more they add additives to the bread, the worse off you're going to be. So as a, um, you know, as guides, just look at the, the, the label and see how this fits. Uh, the, the refining the food detracts from its qualities, but the body's tough. You know, th doing things like going from brown rice to white rice doesn't seem to have made a big difference in the, in the sense that there, there were in in, before 1980, 2 billion Asians and nobody was overweight. They had no prostate cancer. Essentially, no breast cancer, no, almost no heart disease on white rice. But I think white bread is even more refined and less less nutritionally attractive than white flour is less attractive or less nutritionally intact than would be white rice. I think white rice still maintains some of its integrity compared to white flour. You, know, you can get that stuff down to pretty much nothing but flour. Have you heard of pacha bread, Dr. McDougall? They sell it at Whole Foods. I generally don't eat bread. At least I didn't for since I yeah. lost weight in 2012 up until recently. And it's just made out of three ingredients, buckwheat, water, and salt. And it's actually yeah. really good. 
Do they do they heat it slowly? Is I'm not sure. Too? I, 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 I it, it's kind of more dense. I had the, the 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 creator on the show, and and I really like it. I don't eat it every day, but it's it's quite delicious and comes in four. Well, my guess is that this is a slowly heated uh, bread that you know undergoes under the name of the scene or or seafarer's bread. Uh, what they do is they take uh, sprouted wheat and they slow cook it in an oven. And in the process of slow cooking, you break down the complex sugars into sweet sugars, simple sugars. And simple sugars taste sweeter than complex sugars. So the bread tastes sweet, but it's because of the breakdown of the sugar into more simple sugars by slow heating. That would be my guess as to what she serves. And I think that would be fine. I don't see that as a, unless you're looking at losing weight. If you're looking at losing weight, then refined products and simple sugars shouldn't be your first, shouldn't be one of your high choices. You should go for unrefined starch, add some fruits and vegetables, maybe some extra fruits and vegetables if you want to lose, or extra non-starchy vegetables if you want to lose weight faster. Well, that's our maximum weight loss program. Yeah. So I don't have any more questions on the topic of low carb, but I know you have just a couple minutes left. Would you be able to answer just the general kind of medical questions? I think I'm, I'm still doing okay. Okay. Thanks, Dr. McDougall. Um, this is from Tim and he says he knows you don't like colonoscopies, and but you're okay with sigmoidoscopies. And he says he has an ileocecal valve that is stuck in the open position. Can this be fixed during a sigmoidoscopy or will he have to have a colonoscopy to get it to shut? I, I have no idea. I mean, an ileocecal would be between the last part of the small intestine and, and your large intestine. And I, I've never heard of repairs of that being done by a colonoscopy. Certainly a sigmoid, which is only two feet long, would not be able to reach it. But I, I can't imagine that these scopes would do anything positive about uh, the ileocecal valve. I would put good food next to that valve, I bet it's gonna work just fine. Particularly if you do the, a starch-based diet for you know a, a few days. F fix, fix what you put in the intestines first before you think the problem is due to some outside forces. You know, look at the obvious, starch-based diet. Eat a diet of potatoes, see if it goes away. I bet it will, that'd be my guess. I wouldn't you know, eat just, beans and lentils because they have so much gas in them. And I imagine some of your problem is uh, is cramping and back up. And so you don't want to eat gassy foods like uh, legumes. But potatoes would be a good choice as a test. Rice would be fine. Well, you know, I just thought of something. Um, doc, you know, you know Dr. John Scharfenberg, right? Uh, no, I've known Scharfenberg. For let's see, 19, 1970, I think 1973 we met. It's amazing. So it's been how many years? It's been 50 years that John and I have been friends. Well, he's my bestie up here, and he's going to be turning 100 um, yeah. next week. And he's coming to my house for a big brunch with uh, Dr. Neil Nevin. Cool. Which, would you would you wish him happy birthday? Can we like FaceTime with yeah. you or, or yeah, something? Yeah, well, Shar Sharfenberg, Sharfy, I think was how we used to. That's what I call Sharfy. He's yeah. adorable. Yeah, well, he he actually he did a couple of things, as I remember. He was at Castle Hospital with me. He's a Seventh Day Adventist, so his uh, his science uh, is heavily involved with religion, with the Seventh Day Adventist Church and Ellen White's teachings. Not that it is wrong; it's just that it's, it has had a big influence on Adventist teachings. And John uh, John Scharfenberg is a very strong Adventist, as I remember. And yeah. uh, he got into a debate. I don't know. I don't remember who the man's name was, but you might remember to ask him. A debate with somebody from the meat industry. And I offered some of the same arguments that we're offering today. But, you know, I think at that time, the, the, the viewing audience was still so confused that they really couldn't dissect out the importance of Scharfie's message. And the truth. So he did that. The other thing is he wrote the back cover. He wrote an endorsement on my first national best-selling book, The McDougall Plan. 
So we go back a long, a long way. We used to, I can't remember the things we disagreed about, but probably not too many. Well, you know, he does, what do you think about intermittent fasting? Because he's done it most of his life, but he does it by skipping dinner, which to me is like, uh oh. Well, then I guess I intermittently fast too. But you don't skip dinner, do you? On occasion. Really? So you he- Well, if, I, if I'm not hungry, I don't eat, AJ. You know, I only eat when I'm hungry. And, you know, I'm, I'm on a pattern of three times a day. But if I'm not hungry at lunchtime, I don't eat. If I'm not hungry at dinner, I don't eat. And, you know, sometimes I'll start out with a bowl of oatmeal that is huge with lots of fruit in it. And it takes me like a half an hour to eat it because I... Anyway, I'm not I'm not hungry for lunch. And I can go till dinner time before I want to eat, but the hunger drives, you can trust it, but you've got to give it the right food. Nice. Okay, maybe we got time for one. Oh, so I I don't you asked me what I think of fasting. Well, intermittent uh, fasting. I, well, intermittent fasting. Well, first of all, you have to realize it's nothing I've put a lot of effort into. So I'm open for a correction on anything I might. I might give you an opinion on that doesn't have a lot of facts behind it. But intermittent fasting has been practiced by religions, as far as I'm aware, for all of eternity. It's been part of basically every religion. So there must be some value to it to stop eating until Friday or Sunday or whatever the day picked. Uh, I don't believe that results in uh, any effective change in people's eating habits. Or it results in any really dramatic changes in their current health condition. Now, if you fast longer than intermittent fasting, like you go to True North, then I've seen some pretty interesting things happen, which would verge on the on the edge of miracles. And that's where people really reset their life. They don't eat for a long period of time. And then when they get finished with their water fast, they're given the McDougal diet at True North without salt and sugar. And it, everything, the best food they ever ate. So it offers them a chance to get away from the old stimuli, the Western diet, <laughs> to kind of clean things out and to get their taste buds back and to really appreciate hunger. And I think in that circumstance where you allow the body to, as they say, rest, can't confirm this, but as they say, rest the body, it may be able to heal itself faster. I can't, I cannot confirm that or support it or deny it because our patients heal pretty darn fast when you put them on a, just a diet of starch, rice, and fruits. They don't have to starve, most of them. Those that are not compliant, who need a little more education, they'll do well going to True North where they'll make them learn to like a healthy diet. And there are a few people who don't get well, who the extra step of trying the ultimate elimination diet, which is a water fast. That's the ultimate elimination diet. And you go to True North and see whether they can fix you. If they can't fix you, and again, they feed you the local diet when you leave. And it's delicious. And first, one of the first like things I got after my fast that I did in September was this soup. And it literally is just Yukon gold potatoes and zucchini. It was like the best thing I ever tasted. Well, you know, it's, uh, I, I think the thing that uh, is disturbing me most is the fact that uh, so little has gone in a positive direction when we've known so much, AJ. I can recall going into my chief of medicine's office back in uh, 1972, just as I was finishing my medical residency at John Burns School of Medicine. You know, I became a board certified internist. <laughs> you know, I, I went into his office and, you know, I, I they knew what kind of medicine I was practicing, you know, based on diet. And my chief of medicine told me he was very concerned that I was going to starve to death because all I was going to do is collect bums and hippies. And plus, I didn't have the standard medical practice that collects a whole bunch of people and and dings them every month or so uh, for their refills. So he was concerned that Mary and I and our children were not going to be able to make their place economically in the world with my crazy ideas. And uh, I told him then I was wrong. This was 1970. I thought he was wrong. I thought that people would rush to my door. He was right. They didn't. 
But I think I was right about one statement that I made to Irv Schatz, who is dead now, my former chief of medicine from John Burns School of Medicine, is I pointed at Dr. Schatz's prospering abdomen. And I told him, I said, you know, it's not going to be bums and hippies that are attracted to me. I said, it's going to be successful people, people who've worked hard to get an education, to uh, raise their family with good moral values, who've developed businesses, who really get a big kick out of life. These successful people along the way are going to say to themselves, I'm such a big success. I got so much money. I got such a nice family. I got you know, 50 acres of prime land. I'm such a big success. How come I'm so fat? How come I'm so sick? How come I got to take all these pills? And I told my chief of medicine back in 1972, I said that uh, I'm going to be there and give them an answer. I'm going to give, you, give them the answer that allows them to be successful in their health. It's the food. And, you know, AJ, I have to look back and say, although there has not been a revolution like I'd hoped for coming out of the knowing the truth, uh, that's the kind of people I've been able to associate with for the last uh, 50 years, 55 years is successful people. The people that Mary and I attract, <clears throat> we've attracted to our hospital program, our resort program, and our telemedicine program, have been people who get a big kick out of life. That they're successful, they've worked hard, uh, they've gotten an education. They, you know. And these people who, when they find out why such an important area they're failing in, and you give them the right answer, they do it. And those are the kind of people that we are associated with. Now, I, I want to make some uh, qualification to what I just said. And success just doesn't mean finances. Uh, we have, uh, based on finances, taken care of several groups of people who would not be considered successful based on money. Like, for example, we took care of the Baptist Church in Oakland, the members who are primarily black. And my guess is their financial status was at the lower end. We took care of the people from the food bank in Sacramento. And what I can tell you is that these people of lower income status, less opportunity, when they saw an opportunity to get their health back, they took it at with as great of enthusiasm as my most fortunate people financially. So, I, you know, I don't know. You know, I really don't know based upon you know a lot of the ideas I had, who's going to do it and who's not. I've had to come down to the conclusion that people have to like themselves. You, you really have to care about yourself to do these kinds of things, like quitting smoking, put on your safety belt, et cetera, to change your diet. And as far as understanding the simplicity of the message, you don't you don't have to be very well educated. You know, you don't have to have a hotshot manager's job. You, it, it's pretty simple. You know, you eat rice, corn, and potatoes. And fruits and vegetables. You don't eat animals. You don't eat free oils. Eat as much as you want. Your hunger drive is perfect. And so we should be out there as a group. And, you know, we still have a whole future ahead of us, uh, AJ. You and I and the rest of the people listening or should out there be, be out there causing a revolution to happen because so much is at stake. Everything's at stake. Whether you get your friends and relatives and you know, our country gets a higher rate of infectious disease, or whether we have food available or not. I mean, the changes that are taking place are serious. And we have a part to play. So, you know, when are we going to get out in the streets and start protesting? <laughs> right after lunch. <laughs> Dr. McDougall, it is so fun talking to you. I really appreciate spending time well, with you. you. This. Well, you, you, play a, you play, a, play a big part in this whole movement. You've got a great following. I, I appreciate them also. Well, anyway, they, we'll get together in about a month. In the meantime, I, I, we, we run 12-day programs. We'd love to have you involved. And we will give you the best chance of getting your health back off your drugs. Yeah. And uh, we have a Sunday night program, every Sunday night, 5 o'clock Pacific time. Then we'd love to spend some time talking to you. And then AJ lets me on her show once a month. So I'd have to let you on more often if you have time. Did you like the towels I sent you for Christmas? Yeah, that's, that's nice. Thank you. Oh, I, I, want you to know, I, had a, I had a chance to talk to a couple of medical groups this past couple of weeks. So things are changing. I talked 
Well, let's not bother with the names. There are a couple of uh, uh, medical schools. <clears throat> I don't want to give them a bad reputation that allowed me to give them my message that it's the food. And uh, they were very responsive. And we have a set of lectures, uh, five or 10 hours of lectures, five lectures that are available for purchase. They make great Christmas gifts. And I think Heather is giving away free books too. Nice. Well, just make sure people get on your mail. We have, we have six of our books, Mary. They're free. When you go to check out, we have six of our books. Six books that I own the titles to you for the uh, that I own the titles to that we're giving you for Christmas for free. Just go to the website, drmcdougall.com. Go to the shopping cart when you end up uh, shopping for these particular books. You should end up with a zero balance, and it'll be sent to you as PDF files. So Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and Thank holidays you. and whatever else you're celebrating. Don't eat turkey. Right, we won't see you till after the holidays. Yeah, so. you, you can eat little piece of turkey. Just, Dr. McDougal, it, it, it just turns out that because your show is the first Monday of the month, the first Monday of the month is New Year's Day. Well, we, I don't know. I, I'd be glad to get together with you. I don't no, that, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougal. Let's, let's see if we can get our, our faithful following to join us. Soon. I think they will. And all thanks right. Thank all you. of you. Thank you, Dr. McDougal and Mary. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 11 a.m. tomorrow for Straight Talk with Dr. Doug Lyle. We are going to be covering uncharted territory. And it's going to be very provocative if he approves some of the questions that will be sent in. I've never had this topic come up before. Take care, everyone. <laughs>